Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. If you listen to the podcast often, you already know what I'm going to say. Go to focuscompound.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. Uh, and of course, if you want to follow along with everything that we push out into the investing universe, the best way to do that is to follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at at Focused Compound. Uh, Jeff, are you uh, thinking about creating a Twitter yourself? Creating your own X account? No. You used to be on X. I do remember that. You used to be on Twitter, actually, I should yes. say. This was mm -hmm. back in back in the day. Did you actually ever like tweet ideas and thoughts? I can't remember. I think I just remember you pushing out no. your articles. Is that correct? Correct. Did you ever respond to people? Uh, I don't remember if I ever responded to people. I mean, I followed people and read things that they said, and I may have retweeted something. Mm -hmm. Did you ever find it to be a useful tool to get you know information, things going on in the world, stock ideas and stuff like that? Um, no, no, <laughs> I guess if you did, you would still be on it. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not so, still on it for other reasons. Yeah. Like what? Well, I just don't want to be on a social media thing. Um, even when I was on it before following people and stuff, I would take them off, uh, because you know, I'd be interested in just what things that they're writing and everything. And then it's all their comments about everything. A lot of what used to be blog things switched to. Twitter, X, and many of those blogs don't exist anymore. And I followed those people when they first went on to um, what is now X. But um, over time, then they start posting lots of other things, not what I was interested in. And so I stopped following them and everything. Whereas mm -hmm. they, when they had a blog, they kept it more on topic to just the blog things that they did. So, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on Substack? Uh, it's a lot like blogs, but less frequent and more to be monetized and stuff i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. first time i went on subsec i thought wow why didn't we come up with this it's like made perfectly tailored perfectly to what we do and what we have done to communicate with people mm -hmm. right like blog posts podcasting they have a payment thing on there and it just makes everything super simple you know like one of the best things I ever heard about Substack, I think it was actually Andrew Walker that said it, was it just everything works, you know? Like it's just simple and easy and everything works. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that is true. It's a really cool platform. So on today's podcast, Jeff, we're going to be talking about market share and profitability. And if you think that they yeah. are related, we could talk about different industries where they may be related, where they may not be related. Um, and, you know, just get your thoughts. I mean, is uh, you know, is it better from a company's perspective to have higher market share? Does that always mean that that will translate into higher profitability from the company? Uh, just curious to hear your thoughts on market share and profitability, if you think they're related, and uh, how you typically judge those two things when looking at a company. We could start with market share first. Yeah, I don't think it matters. I think that it's impossible to measure and that there's no good empirical studies on it because of how you define market share. And also that you have problems that the market share that you're measuring at a period in time is a result of historical factors that probably mainly continue to today. So companies that are more successful in the past would be more likely to have more market share, just like companies more successful in the past would be more likely to have re higher retained earnings today. So it's kind of like, you know, looking at the S&P 500 and thinking it's a representative group of companies. It's not. They're like older and more profitable and stuff because they got big by having retained earnings. And most of them didn't just raise a lot of money in public markets. Same thing here. If they're market share leaders, they didn't randomly get there in the United States. In other countries, it might be different. You could have something that was a market share leader because it was the government or something and it, somehow it, it came in that way. Um, but you'd have to comp things off of that. To me, there's no good blind studies and stuff that way, no good control studies where um, you're comparing something that has market share but didn't have great profitability before to something that has high profitability but not great market share. You're just assuming that if it has high market share today, it, you can compare it to things that have lower market share today without worrying about the fact of how did it get to that market share. It, it's 
not really makes a lot of sense to me that it, something would have higher low market share and that that wouldn't be indicative of, of things about the past and people's preferences. So I think that's mostly what you're capturing. Just like when we talk about growth, I think most of growth stuff, there's some that it captures accurately, but I think unfortunately a lot of the statistical stuff is mostly capturing profitability, historical profitability when they think they're doing like future growth and stuff. They're self-funding basically, you know, if you did growth, that was all raised by IPOs and stuff, then maybe it could be different. We could do unprofitable growth companies. Maybe that's a category that someone could study, but otherwise you're mostly getting high profitability companies in your growth. You're getting high quality companies in your higher market share, at least in terms of the proposition to the customer usually. Yeah. That's how mm -hmm. they got it. Can you think of a company that has very high market share? I mean, like more than half or more, maybe more of a monopoly type market share that has very low profitability? Um, that's a good question. So historically, I can think of things that had high market share, but low profitability, at least not in terms of not earning their cost of capital and stuff, but that might have been financial engineering. Um, and those were monopoly type situations that I can think of. Um, there was a, a company called Paradise, I think it sold out. Um, it was a micro cap in Florida and in Plant City, Florida. And it eventually got into a plastics business too. But what it made was um, candy fruit for the uh, making of fruit cakes, right? And so they probably, yeah, they probably had close to, they certainly were the only major player, whether they officially had 100% market share, 50% market share, what. Um, there might have been some companies that were doing it internally and so didn't buy it outsource, but basically 100% market share and uh, not a very profitable company. Yeah. When did they sell out? Do you remember that? I don't know if it was five years ago or something. I, I'd have to check. It's It was a very mm -hmm. small company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the other end of the spectrum? Businesses that basically don't have any market share at all, but are incredibly profitable. I mean, those companies do have to have some sort of moat or something about them that allows them to be uh, as profitable as they are, right? Yeah. Um, that's why I think it doesn't make sense to look at the market thing. So there's tons of companies that have very little market share and are highly profitable. So that's not unusual. Um, like it wouldn't be unusual for an insurance company that that's, has 1% market share to be as profitable as one that has 10%. That's pretty typical. Um, you know, it the most profitable um, car companies today are ones that have like 1%, not 10%. Some of, some of the most profitable beer things today, 1%, not 10%. So now there were companies in beer and cars when they had 50% market share that were highly profitable compared to smaller ones doing the same thing. But against companies that are doing more niche things in different ways, it's, it's not necessarily that they have higher profitability. Um, and there's lots of industries where there's high profitability with some mass-produced things that have very high market share. And there's also another sort of tail of high profitability with very small companies that pursue a very high, um, a, a, a higher price type approach or whatever, you know? So let's say cars or something, we'd have to try to compare Toyota and Ferrari. Are they both highly profitable? You know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's true at one time that that wasn't the case when the industries in the United States were very national uh, the regional ones had all been put out of business and stuff, but there wasn't a lot of foreign competition both in beer and cars, um, the top players had very, very high profitability. There's also industries that have high, where market share has gotten higher and yet profitability has not gotten higher. Um, and profitability may have even been higher when the market share was less um, uh, concentrated. Cruise lines, for instance. Uh, they got more concentrated over time and yet I don't think that they increased their profitability over time. So, Why do you think that they is? They could just be... Because lots of other factors, so I just I don't think it made a huge difference one way or the other. I don't know that it's a critical factor one way or the other about how much market share you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think market share and market power are interrelated or no? Not really. I mean, sometimes they could be. So, I mean, I think there's critical, critical concepts. The, the one that I always stress is the really important thing is how do you enter? The important thing is entry and exit, you know, again, microeconomic stuff, right? So in a industry's lifespan usually there's not a lot of in entry and exit at the same time 
in the early phases, there's way more entry. And then there's sometimes more exits. And then sometimes things rise and fall. But so like you have a couple thousand car companies enter, but then after that, you don't have a lot of car companies enter again for almost ever. We saw mm-hmm. that with the airlines, right? We had a lot of entries and stuff, but then for the last 30 years, it's been way lower than the 30 years previous. So I think entry and exit is important. The minimum scale that you need to be profitable and compete with others is critically important critically critically important so that's why when people ask like who do i think has one of the widest moats i would say bwx technologies the old babcock and wilcox nuclear business because you say what is the minimum scale you need to compete in the nuclear reactor business well they don't make civilian nuclear reactors anymore really so um i mean they maintain some and officially you could buy them but you know no one does and so there haven't been projects in that ever happening. So that's not realistic. You can't do projects for countries that are hostile to other countries. So you can't simultaneously do projects for China and Russia and for the United States and France and stuff. So what are you left with? Well, the biggest customer is the U.S. nuclear Navy, right? That's actually more than half the market probably worldwide in any given year. And they have two classes of ships that need them. They have a class of submarines or some, sometimes they have two classes going at the same time, but basically they have submarines that need them and they have, um, carriers that need them when a carrier needs it. It's, it's more than one unit basically. So it's like you're doing more than one reactor effectively, but the minimum unit that you can have is one in terms of an order is one sub order, right? Cause they have to come in a certain size. You can't have one one hundredth of a nuclear reactor. Either you need a nuclear reactor or you don't. And the smallest increment it can come in, I would say is a U.S. sub. So carrier is bigger than that. So carriers aren't built every year. Subs may be. Some years there may only be two. Some years there might be one or something. So you get down to a level where you need almost 100% market share in some years or you have no business, right? So there literally could just be space for one company in that. Um, We talked about a market. And that that goes on for lots of things. That goes on for all sorts of mega projects that people know about. But it also goes on for things that are just hard to enter you know, um, United States animated movies. We want to make an animated movie. It's not going to look like other people's animated movie unless you're willing to spend $100 million on production things, partner with someone who's willing to market it in the same sort of level, or you have to market it yourself. So what you're saying is, I want to take several years and work on a project that's $100 million, $200 million. That's not even counting overhead and stuff. Those are direct costs that you have on this one project. You also would have some sort of overhead for having an operation at all. So even if someone gave you overhead and distribution and said, come on my lot and make this, but you're going to make it yourself, you're talking about, you know, a very big investment. There's no way to dip your toe in the industry. Um, So that's why it's hard to enter and exit certain industries. There are other ones where it's really easy to enter. And a lot of times when it changes that situation, that can be the biggest issue. So when I looked at village supermarket and stuff, I always said the big issue is not what a lot of people are afraid of was online and Walmart and stuff. The big issue is like a model like the fresh market, which was trying to do stores a fifth, a sixth, whatever the size of others, putting it in places where leasing spaces that other people hadn't needed for a big supermarket, and then they can put it in there. Small scale supermarket that works, that could be real competition for your villages and your, you know, your, your shop rights and your, your Wegmans and your HEBs and your Publix. But because you've now made something where you say the scale is now I can make a supermarket that's much smaller. So it makes it easier to enter, right? Otherwise, it's really hard to enter. Um, I think that generally has the biggest um, determinant of it is what it, do you need to be, what is the ante to get in on the industry? And then what is the level of viability? And we talked about that with vineyards, um, breweries, and uh, distilleries, right? Mm-hmm. basically you can make a vineyard profitable at a smaller scale than you can make a brewery profitable at a smaller scale than you can make a distillery profitable. So, um, you know, like, like even in Boston beers history, Sam Adams, they originally did contract stuff and they would admit that they were early on that, that they just had this, their CEO had this dream of owning an actual brewery and doing it themselves, but they didn't need to, and they shouldn't have done it. And so it worked out eventually for them, but actually taking the physical plant and doing that is a mistake. And it's not so much a mistake if you were a wine company the same size, but you know, um, 
and spirit companies, you can, if you really look into it, you may not want to, but you can figure out, you can actually find out that your very expensive um, liquor that you're buying is often made in the exact same distillery as things that are 80% cheaper and stuff made by a giant corporation. Um, there aren't actually that many. It doesn't mean that it's they don't have control over everything else, but they're just contracting it out and using their facility. So it's just, yeah, there's, there's not the scale to do a very small distillery that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you were talking a little bit about barriers to exit. Can you take listeners through how you typically think about that? Well, barriers to exit is tricky because um, a lot of times I'd say it's it's you know these are psychological type things in both directions, right? The, the airlines are the worst, right? Airlines are just the worst industry in terms of the psychology behind it, because on for, cars are pretty bad too, but cars may be as bad as airlines. But mm-hmm. airlines are really bad because there's a irrational desire for people to start up airlines and stuff, entrepreneurs basically. And sometimes countries too, but definitely entrepreneurs. And then there's an irrational desire to keep them operating even when they're bad and shouldn't be operating by governments and stuff. And so you have that problem. Um, And and you have some of that same problem with cars. Um, You have an irrational desire of people to be in the car business, very sexy business. And then you have a desire by uh, by, um, business and stuff never to let them shut down or leave their town or stuff. Um, So... Whereas when we mention cruise things and stuff, actually cruise things benefit from that because one thing that they have really well going for them is they buy giant, giant, giant ships. And they're one of the only ones that aren't a government buying giant ships. And, you know, think about that employment situation. If you're the mayor of a town that has a shipyard that builds cruise ships, the one thing your job is is to make sure that you never get an order canceled, that they never close the shipyard. And there's only a dozen, uh, you know, half a dozen of them really around the world that build the biggest ships. And you make sure that no matter what, they're staying in your town, in, in your province, your state, your country. And if you have to give them all the tax breaks and all the things and whatever, you have to do that. Um, because otherwise, it'd be thousands of people out of work and the knock on effects of all that. It's like, you know, being the mayor of Detroit, you got to keep them making cars there, you know. You're not. You're, part of your job is making sure you know, like a Boeing or a General Motors or whatever, never leaves. Well, at the shipyard ones, that's what it is. They're not mainly in the United States, so we don't know as much about them. But there's a lot of incentives to keep them there and operating, to the benefit of the customers buying from them, right? Hmm. Mm-hmm. But as an investor, how do you think about that? Do you like the ability for companies to basically pack it in and shut down if they need to because it's no longer financially? viable or do you want it like a cruise ship where it's like okay we're gonna pack it in but we still have this billion dollar ship yeah so i mean there's kind of an advantage to that historically so historically on transport things things that can't move instantly from place to place that easily and be repositioned are better than things that can now, you have a larger sunk cost into it, and you've got problems. If there's inflation, if governments tax you, if whatever, you're in trouble on that. But the big, adva- the big advantage is that it's not as easy to reposition those things as it is for airlines. You know, So that has been the problem with airlines. It's very easy to reposition planes, and there's a lot of choices with different, airline- with different airports. Um, you're very limited in terms of cruise ports and how you can reposition um, cruise ships. So it was better that way, yes. But you do have a highly specialized asset that, um, you know, you're stuck with that way. But that's everything. Look, the, the highest returns and things, right, are what? Casinos and Disney World and stuff, um, oil companies like we talked about that have some great oil in Saudi Arabia or whatever. The government can take it away. It's only good for one thing. You can't trade it anywhere. You know, I mean, you have to please local things. You have to not have the assets seized. You have to not be taxed too much on it. You have to not have anything happen to your specific place. Right. If you happen to have a casino in Las Vegas, great. If you had it in Atlantic City, ooh, that mm-hmm. didn't turn out too well. You know what I mean? But on paper, they could have seen the same thing. Um, having it in one place worked out a lot better than another. You know, so the highest returning assets are usually highly specialized assets, which you then can't reverse and get out of. That's always the trade-off. The things you could liquidate really easily and make a lot of mo- you know get your money back on are unfortunately things like an airline. Like you know, if you had to close up shop, if you weren't overly indebted and stuff, and the government let you. If you had to close up shop and liquidate an airline, you kind of could um, and get a lot of the money back, at least for the lenders. But that's why the industry is so bad compared to other ones. Like any, you know, you can repaint the 
planes and other people can take them. And th- you're, you're very similar to everyone else. It's very generic. So they will take it over. But um, you, that usually things that have very high returns are highly specialized and don't serve a purpose when separated from other things. Sometimes that's a problem. Like when people talk about Paramount and they're like, oh, you know, here are the, some of the parts and stuff. Some of those parts are integrated with each other. Mm-hmm. So you can't just start pulling this part out without an agreement from the other company to keep that there, you know? Um, like they say, oh, well, you take the streaming thing, separate it from the TV studio, separate it from the movie studio. Well, when you did that, you know, people may not realize that, but associated with all that stuff was Star Trek, Mission Impossible, Untouchables, whatever. Those rights are mixed in with all of that. And for some of them, they may not realize that when you pull those things apart, you know, um, you would have to have agreements from other people to get you so that you could always get royalties off of that and stuff over time, at least, or prom- or promises forever that, you know, they'd have to be able to distribute it or do whatever you want for it, you know. So it's a factor sometimes in some of them, you know, that, that you um, uh, have your most valuable assets are ones that you end up integrating too much into other things, so they're not specialized. Uh, so they are specialized. They're not able to be sold that easily. Usually if you can break something up really easily, then those are the bad business. I mean, so like there's a there's a thing out right now for uh, U.S. Steel, right? I think it's a 50-some dollar offer. Do you remember? Is it 55? Is it 50? It's in the 50s. Um, and uh, the there were probably the next bidders that we knew about and stuff where at least we're offering publicly 35 or higher or something. The stock's somewhere in between, right? So lousy business, but generic. Like uh, other companies can look and say, look, capacity is worth what capacity is worth and I can buy it this way. So it's in my interest to buy it and then I can operate how I want to. Um, Which is not the decision necessarily with, you know, Paramount or something. It's not as easy to see that. It's easier to value what's the takeover value of United States Steel than it is Paramount because it's like, how does it fit with what you have and... They're, they're specialized assets, but this is worse business, but a worse business often means it's closer to being able to be liquidated or to be understood as just something where you buy the capacity and stuff. And plugged in, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is the trade-off. When, I mean, when, you know, if, you know, uh, you have something that has a lot of assets um, that can be put to use in other things, then it could be changed and and turned over into other stuff and so that's why you have the the possibility of like it makes sense to exit right but then there's other ones where when the assets are highly specialized it often doesn't make sense to exit um or companies won't so you know like um let's say you know we're doing a podcast here what about like the things that do podcast hosting stuff what about search things what about uh social media we talk about x whatever um there's one way to make money on it. And if you don't, then, it, you know, the choice is either like close it up for nothing or operate it and be a big success. There's a strong incentive to try to get really big scale and make it a success. There's not a very strong incentive to sell out to someone else to blend it into what they have and, you know, um, have value out of it. Right. So like people don't, don't think you could buy X and I get to retain all the customers, even if I change everything about it, you know, so that's the thing about that. So I do think the, and there's a term for it where I think they say minimum effective scale, minimum efficient scale, something like that, um, is a technical term for what I'm describing, which is what's the habitable zone, as I think is a better way of thinking about it. Because there's often different scale things depending on the approach you take in an industry and how you can enter it. And so there's specific places where you could enter and then other places where you are less likely to be able to enter, right? So when we talk about movie things, entering as I want to make uh, be on the production side of animated movies, not a good idea. But if you say, I want to distribute art films, I want to distribute foreign films for the American market, yep, you can come in, you just need a few million dollars, you can start doing it tomorrow. Um, and a bunch of companies have come in and out down there with a market share from half a percent to 4% or something and have entered and exited in that. And you can do it. And then you could, if you did do that and made money doing that, you could eventually try to make other things and go from there into other stuff, right? So it's a place that you can enter, um, you know, with the, uh, there's lots of industries like that. There's the, the biggest court company in the 
in the world is really big in the distribution of Quark stuff. Um, but it's not hard to enter on the resource side of just being able to um, uh, to harvest cork trees and stuff and give a production of the most basic part of the material and stuff. So you can enter on that side. On the side of distributing around the world and, and selling it to people who need it and everything, that part of it is the part that is more difficult to enter. Not necessarily all that profitable and stuff, but it's the distribution side of it worldwide that's very hard to enter, you know? But there's other industries where that's not the case. It would be easier to enter into distributing stuff for cars and things than it is to enter on manufacturing where the scale necessary is huge, right? So it's like where the scale needs to be very, very big to get started is often where the problem is. Um, and most of what it's about is learning experience and a lot of good systems and stuff that you could have. So you can start in one niche and then expand from there. Um, you know, and that's the problem with a lot of industries is like we talk about, I think we've talked about restaurants before, for instance. The thing with that is people will say it's such a bad business. Well, it may be such a bad business to be a giant company in it, but that's because it's such a good business to be an independent operator. Basically, it's one of these industries where you could be successful on an incredibly small scale. You could literally have one location. You could have 40 seats and you can make money, right? And try doing that at that scale in other businesses of saying, I'm gonna have one location, I'm gonna have X amount of sales, I'm gonna do this, and I'm going to be have as good margins and stuff as companies that are really big. You can't do that in steel, you can't say, I'm gonna set up a little steel shop down the corner, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna compete with US Steel out of my, you know, 5,000 square foot location, but you can in, you can compete with Cheesecake Factory out of your 5,000 square foot restaurant um, and have things that are comparable to it. So it's, that's how I think is the really big factor. Um, I think a lot of our thoughts about market share to me is very, very heavily influenced. I think a lot of our thinking about a lot of business things is very heavily influenced by the internet media companies. Okay, what do you mean by that? that? And Well, they're very rare. They have very little to do with most business. Yes, they are a big part. They're a meaningful part of the U.S. economy. They're a big part of the stock market, and they're a big part of the parts that people are interested in. But I don't think that we should necessarily be obsessed with the metas and alphabets and apples and um, Amazons and Netflixes uh, of the world. Uh, they have very little to me to do with how business works worldwide in most all industries and stuff and they're just you know fairly unique that way that it's like a daily paper or something i don't if we got obsessed with the you know buffett talked about survival of the fattest and stuff i don't think people have used daily newspapers as being the model of how all economic activity works but they are doing that kind of thing when you're saying google and netflix and um and even i think large parts of amazon and stuff um you know all the businesses that they're in are businesses we're talking about where the scale is huge and there's huge benefits to having huge scale. Um, and even the things they've tried to get into and haven't worked out, like Amazon was unsuccessful in trying to enter the, the grocery market, um, was the same sort of attempt. And some of them have even Amazon stuff had thought about car things before in terms of dealerships and things. So same idea. Those would be things where they could see the same sorts of scales. What they did get into AWS where is something with huge scale that way? Um, so I think that that's why there's an obsession with the things like market share and stuff, which is justifiable in those industries because, you know, there's incredible scale advantages. Sure. You know, um, if you had an operating system that was one tenth the size of Microsoft's uh, Windows or you had Windows, they're both going to cost about the same amount to in terms of your total corporate expenses. So it's just one's going to be having a lot more profit than the other, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. Cool. Well, I want to thank you so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're joining us, be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us here today. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrew at focuscompound.com or click that invest with us tab at our website, focuscompound.com to get more access on that. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.